This is a Channel Africa podcast. You can also get Channel Africa on satellite, PAS10, DSTV Audio Bouquet 802, and Open View Bouquet, Channel 628. Our progressive African tonight. It will be our new space to showcase and acknowledge the work of African people on the on the continent and in the diaspora. And uh, tonight we are launching with the powerful story of Richman Bongani Mahlang, an author, a motivational speaker. He's currently based, Sheila, mm-hmm. in Las Vegas, the United States of the America. Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, Uba Bridgman's story is not only a powerful one, but also an important one. So so much so that he has written a poignant and inspiring self-help book that shares his personal journey from a challenging upbringing in apartheid South Africa to achieving success in the United States of America. The book is more than a personal narrative. It's a guide and a source of motivation demonstrating that hard work, resilience, and a positive attitude can lead to remarkable achievements. It is with pleasure that we get to speak with Bob Richman, Richman Mahlangu, an educational psychologist and author of Success Beyond Expectations, ahead of his tour back home, back home in South Africa this coming June. Help me welcome Bob Richman Mahlangu. Bob Mahlangu, thank you so much for joining us on Africa tonight. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, it's overwhelming, but um, oh. it's a great honor to have an opportunity to speak to you. And I'm grateful for that. Um, and uh, the music was just absolutely the bomb. I haven't listened that closely to uh, my roots, my African music in a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was just a surprise because I'm in my office here with the door shut and all of a sudden the music comes on and I just wanted to start dancing. But I thought, well, Aww. unfortunately, I have nobody to celebrate Aww. this with me. But <laughs> thank you so much for the uh, this opportunity. and the time you took to plan this um, uh, this chance for me to be able to share my story and celebrate with everybody else. Now, before we sink our teeth into your memoir, which also doubles up as a self-help book as well as your up- upcoming tour here in South Africa, can we talk about your upbringing, Bab Mahlangu, a bit about what you remember growing up in apartheid South Africa? Yes, sir. Well, I was uh, born in Durban, uh, South Africa, and and grew up in a township of Lamonville. Both of my parents, uh, unfortunately, they've uh, passed away. Both of my parents did not have any formal education. Uh, In fact, they could not read, they could not write. So uh, basically, the idea of doing schoolwork, we were left with, you know, on our own with my siblings. Um, At the time, obviously, at a young age, you do not understand the the hardships that basically your family is going through. As long as mom and dad are there, uh, you happen to have food and have a bed to sleep. Mm. But as I got a bit older, um, unfortunately, my father passed away. I was 12, almost 13, uh, leaving my mother with five children. Uh, and I was the youngest of the five. We had three girls who were older, my brother and myself. Um, and then that's when things started to be a little bit clear about that. I needed to do something uh, to be able to make a better life for myself. And just by accident during that time, um, a gentleman by the name of Benson Lovo, who lived in, in Lamonville in my township, happened to play to be playing tennis with another gentleman called Tobias Mavondla, who was from down the street from my house. There was this old tennis court that um, we had, they had, the, the net had holes and uh, there were holes everywhere on the fence. And I, instead of sitting at home, because uh, everybody was, you know, will come back home and realize that my father is gone forever. Everybody will start crying. So I would leave the house to go and sit there and watch the guys play. They were playing barefoot, some of them, just having fun. And then Benson and Tobias, they came one day and these gentlemen were wearing these beautiful white um, tennis outfits, white shoes and white socks and uh, and they were playing and i thought to myself my word i want to do that one day and uh of course if you're sitting outside watching if they hit the ball out you know you automatically become a, a ball boy by default so i would get the balls but eventually um to make the long uh, story short they recruited me and then benson took me to this place called Ewema, 
uh, where there were uh, teams of uh, uh, black people. Remember this time, um, there were two tennis organization, uh, the TASA, which was composed of black Indians and coloreds, and then the White Tennis Association. Um, so of course I didn't know anything about this. So Benson basically held my hand and introduced me to these men who became uh, actually to the tennis players because there were ladies there as well. Uh, but mo majority of them were uh, um, m uh, black men, which became my mentors. At this time, I had not men, I had not met any educated black men that had, that owned their own cars, that had their own families, um, that um, basically spoke intelligently. Um, one of those men is Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Paulo Zulu and uh, Mr. Late KK and Tiana. There's a bunch of them, obviously. And uh, they become my mentors. They took me under their wing. Uh, so they started to pick me up from uh, from school. I mean, I, I beg your pardon. Um, after tennis, when we play till late in the evening, mm. they'll drop me off at home and then they'll drive home to their families, which was like about 45 minutes away because most of them lived at Timlaz and I lived in Lamondo. Basically, they had 45 minutes after dropping me off to go to their own families. Slowly started, things started to click. And then I just realized that in the township, most of the, the guys I was around, uh, my age, my peers, were drinking alcohol, they were doing drugs, they were smoking weed, skipping school. And somehow I just started clicking, uh, uh, getting this feeling that if I stayed in school and worked hard, there was a chance that I could do a little bit better. But also, I always enjoyed the idea of learning because I felt like this was the only way I was going to be successful. And to add to those men, and I'm I'm sorry, I think I'm taking too much of your time Not here. Not at all. To add to those men, there's a there's a gentleman by the name of Mr. Tim Gray, uh, who had actually um, was living in South Africa, but had, uh, had coached in, in in England. He was now living in South Africa, and just by accident. He happens to be at a worm at S.J. Smith to give somebody a lesson, a one-time thing. And he'd been advised by some of the people back uh, at home in a white area not to go there because of all the propaganda we used to have and uh, that his life may be in danger. And he saw me play against the wall and he came and introduced himself. Um, after that, he went and taught a lesson. After he uh, got done his lesson, he came back and we spoke. And he decided that he was going to make a tennis player out of me. Basically, he recruited me and uh, Benson came and joined us eventually. He recruited me that he, I could come to a place called Kester Hotel, uh, which is on my scrap area. It's about an hour and a half away taking two buses, which I didn't have any money to take a bus with to start with. Uh, he said I could come up there, pick up balls for him when he, he taught this group of young uh, chill, uh, white children tennis uh, gave me a tennis clinic um, and uh, I would get a lesson. And that is how my story of uh, tennis and education kind of became uh, intertwined. intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I obviously met a lot of people who have been so significant in my life, which uh, my life turned out to be what it is now. But there was a life I remember growing up in the township um, it was uh, extremely difficult in the sense that, uh, unfortunately, my sisters, uh, um, they had babies, they got pregnant uh, at a young age. So one of them had twins. So we had four babies in my house. There were 10 people in this one little four-room house. And when I talk about a four-room house in a township, you know what that means. And our listeners know what that mm. means. But uh, we had to, uh, my brother and I, we had to wait for the babies to go to sleep so we could do homework. Uh, we didn't have electricity at the time. We used candles, uh, candlestick to, you know, for, for, uh, for light. But anyway, um, I do believe that those experiences, uh, they toughened me up, basically gave me a, a thick skin to be able to, um, to be able to overcome some of the obstacles that came in my way. And uh, that's basically my, the beginning of uh, how my story started. But Matang, that was absolutely amazing. I mean, hearing the story from where it all began mm. to where he is right now, and obviously the, the inspiration behind the books that he uh, ended up uh, writing, I want to have more conversations with Bob Matang because mm. personally, as an individual, yeah. as a millennial, 
Come I on. need these kind of, kind of words and these kind of success stories to show me that it can actually be done. Mm. It doesn't matter where your background is, where you grew up or the circumstances, you really can change your life. And uh, I, I want to get into that conversation with Ubab Matlangu. We'll take a quick break. And after the break, we'll delve into more inspiration, more conversation about this particular book that he has written, Beyond Expectation, which I am certainly looking forward to. Let's take a break, though, and we'll be back. Get Channel Africa on. DSTV Audio Bouquet. Channel 802. Channel Africa. The African Perspective. Our progressive African on the line. There's none other than educational psychologist and author of Success Beyond Expectations. And this is Obab Richman Mahlang joining us on the line. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your story with us. And as I was listening, I realized that there were pit stops of hope in individuals such as Benson and Tobias and Tim Gray. Uh, let's talk about uh, the kind of advice you give to children, and I see this because I know that you do a lot of motivational speaking to students, right? Learners, specifically in primary and high school and the like. Uh, what do you say to them for those who don't encounter a Tim Gray, a Benson Glovu? Um, how do they continue <laughs> to push and stride on uh, despite the challenges? Okay, uh, well, um May I please just say uh, there's four points I'd like to make first, mm. and then I'll address your question if you don't, if you don't mind. Not at all. Uh, it is it is imperative uh, for people to know that one of the reasons I'm coming home is to celebrate uh, our 30th of democracy in South Africa. Which, when I left, it was not it was not a friendly place for people who look like me. Mm. Um, and the second part is to uh, is to individually thank all the mentors, the the people that um, helped me. Uh, to be where I am today. And the third one is to the empower the youth, which is going to be the point I'm going to, a uh, question you just asked me. And of course, promoting the book. But uh, so I'm work, I work in a, at a high school here in Las Vegas for Clark County School District as a, as a guidance or a high school counselor, I should say. Uh, uh, educational psychology is what I started to become a counselor. And I'm glad you asked that question because um, my story specifically um, sometimes branches off from people thinking about all these horrible things that have happened in life and apartheid and slavery and all this stuff. And in my head, uh, as I look at life, uh, these things have always been there. Somebody's always been a slave somewhere or abused somewhere. Um, but uh, people have had an incredible amount of resiliency and when I sometimes encounter little problems, I look and I stop and think, well, compared to some people like um, Mr. Nelson Mandela, who was willing to go to prison for 27 years, so my life is better. Mm. Uh, Mr. Stephen B Mr. Stephen Biko, knowingly, these people knowingly what could happen to them, uh, that they could be killed, they live, they sacrifice the freedom of their families, and their friends, they were willing to oppose a punitive government. So I have a better future. This is the message I tell to the young people. I say a gentleman by the name of Muhammad Ali was born Cassius Clay, but he was not happy with the name of the slave owner that he had, so he changed his name. If you are, the question is, what are you willing to do to change and improve your life? I want to tell the young people that I'm not here by accident. Whatever the decisions they make is what's going to determine the future, regardless where they come from, that it is your responsibility, not somebody else's, uh, to work hard every day. That doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. Life is going to be difficult specifically, mm -hmm. or especially if you come from a low income background like myself, Sometimes I find it easier to get motivated for me because I didn't have anything. I didn't really have, there was nowhere else to go. I basically, the only thing I had was to go forward. As I was working on this book with my editor, uh, Brenda Joyce from Peter Marisbeck, uh, we were talking and she came up with this uh, saying, it says, uh, when there is nothing, there is uh, the possibility of everything. 
Um, and uh, that, that quote is unknown. It's not specifically hers, but she brought it into my head from what we're talking about. But at the end of the day, I, uh, my message to a lot of young people is that they have the ability to achieve whatever they're trying to achieve in their lives if they are willing to work. And that starts with committing to basic education. We've got to get our education to be able to understand concept and communicate with people. The rest of the staff, if you're working hard, there's always a chance of other people um, who says, well, this lady, this guy is trying hard. I think I'm going to help them. And that's what happened into my life. Uh, I didn't just happen to have this wisdom of one day woke up and think things are going to fall apart. There's a lot of failures. Uh, things were not successful. But um, as I mentioned earlier, that these things thick in my skin, I was able to get up the next day and, and basically pursue my dream, which was, uh, you know, go. Uh, basically, I wanted to get an education. That meant get out of South Africa and the tennis helped me. I went, went to Europe first, uh, ended up in, a, you know, getting an athletic scholarship to go to America. Mm. One time in my life, I had my, I had children, which I was absolutely petrified what their lives were going to look like because my kids uh, in America, they are considered black. Uh, they were born in Austria. Their mom is uh, Caucasian, but in America, they considered black. I was, I was absolutely terrified what their lives were going to look like if they didn't have the education. So I basically uh, started uh, inspiring them with the same message about hard work and putting the work. My kids play tennis uh, every day for two or three hours from right after school until five, six o'clock and they went home. They did not like me very much um, when they were young, but um, fortunately we had incredible results simply because of the same message the oldest got uh, recruited, he went to Harvard, he became a software engineer, and the younger one went to Georgetown University. He Now he owns his own um, investment uh, company. And the reason I'm sharing this part about my children, it's not to brag or basically show off, is to show that this type of message, it's not just a, a pipe dream, it's not something that I just think about in this, uh, in this interview, I'm gonna tell people, the reality is, Every dream without any actions becomes a pipe dream. The people have to get up, they have to go and do things. They've got to be reaching out, struggling, believe in themselves, and realize that they are the captain of their own ship. They, to, to reach their destiny, it's up to them. I hope I'm answering your question. No, absolutely, absolutely. That was brilliant. I want to know, in terms of the challenges that you experienced getting into America, the first few months, the first few years, how was that transition for you? I mean, yes, you started in Europe and then you got that scholarship, uh, the, the tennis scholarship to go to America. How did the American people receive you? How was your experience there? Did you find it difficult to find your feet? This is actually the most inter uh, interesting thing about traveling because, first of all, remember that growing up in South Africa, I had the uh, Bantu education, which, in my opinion, was very, very limiting. Mm. Um, and I'm hoping uh, that most, peop most people know what Bantu education is. It's basically an inferior curriculum that was designed specifically for black schools only. When I got into the plane to fly overseas the first time, I didn't know the difference between Europe, um, uh, North America, Australia. And I certainly did not, uh, when I go to America, I did not know the history of slavery because mm -hmm. we were not taught that. Um, so when I got to America, first of all, I was excited that I'm going to get to meet a lot of black people and make friends and all this stuff. Uh, in the tennis team that I was in to start with, there were no black people. Uh, all the tennis players were white, which obviously most people who play tennis are white, even uh, even in South Africa and most of the countries. Yeah. That was the first start. Um, but interesting enough, um, I basically had absolutely no idea geographically where I was. Uh, people in America, uh, obviously, America is a big country. They're different in different places. But the majority of uh, people in America, they're very friendly. Uh, this friendliness, but sometimes... It, um, it could be something more what we call superficial. 
what uh, uh, in German we say is is uh, I'm, I'm I'm thinking in German. I speak German, by the way, I, because I lived in Austria. Mm-hmm. So sometimes my 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 English fails me, or my Zulu, my Zulu fails me, and then I I think in German. But anyway, <laughs> um, that that came into my mind that well, uh, they're very very friendly. At the same time, it's not very easy to get too close to people. I realized very early that. I was a foreigner. I was in their country. It was my responsibility to to try and get to things that I wanted to get into. But it has been a v- extremely um, a, a difficult journey. At the same time, extremely rewarding. For example, when I went to my classes, again, remember, I'm coming from the Bandu education, mm. getting to a university. Um, and most of the people here, I didn't understand the accent of the professors. Uh, obviously very competent people, a lot of them, most of them, they got their PhDs, but the subjects that they were discussing, I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. So I struggled really, really hard, but uh, being an athlete in America was great help because in the, within the program, they have tutors that can go to class, they can help you take notes and study and all that stuff. But over the years, I have struggled academically uh, because sometimes, again, it's English. It's not my first language. Mm. Uh, I did nobody read to me when I was a kid. Uh, I didn't read a book until I went to college, other than the books in school. So I never really read anything until I was actually in college. In fact, when I went to the library to write my first report, um, I uh, the first book I checked out was the book about Mr. Nelson Mandela. And remember, when I left home, I had never seen his picture anyway. Mm. I never read anything about him because everything was banned in South Africa. And then the library says to me, librarian says to me, oh, you can take the book home if you want and then bring it back during the due date. In my mind, I'm thinking this lady is putting me on. She wants me to get into trouble because I'm going to be accused of stealing the book. (laughs) So now this is the sense of a black kid coming from the township who's been raised under apartheid who who believes that everybody's looking at him with the sense that they're going to do something bad, they're going to steal, they're going to do that, they're going to do that. Um, and um, and then she said, no, you can take the book and check it out, the book. I had never, by the way, been to a library before because we didn't have a library at my high school uh, or all the schools I went to. Um, so all of a sudden, I'm in the library. They said I could take the book. It was the first library other than seeing uh, the library in the books. Um, push forward a little bit, um, after finishing graduate school, you are allowed to work for three years here uh, in Nevada without a, a, the official license. Within the three years, you have to take the test. I started taking the test the second year in, I could not pass this test because I read too slow or too slowly, I should say. Uh, and then eventually I failed the test about seven, eight times and the school had to let me go because I could, uh, I could renew my license. Uh, or the Clark County School District. So I got fired. Again, I did not give up on that employment. I went and took uh, the test for two years. Eventually I passed it, but it took me another three years again to be able to get back and get that position. Um, But I didn't sit here and whine and cry and complain and say, well, you know, it's just bad luck. People don't like me and all this stuff. I took it upon me that it's my responsibility to pass this test and get the job that I wanted. Of course, I had a tutor who helped me uh, uh, study and and get all this stuff done. But at the end of the day, uh, and the idea that there are obstacles and difficulties in life, that is not an issue, a problem. Life is supposed to be like that. Somehow we're being taught sometimes with the Western psychology that if you're having some kind of struggle, you can some kind of a a pain or things are not working the way uh, uh, you want, that is terrible. Your life is is, is terrible. Life is not good. Mm. I tend to differ. I tend to differ. I think life is full of struggle. And if you guys have kids, you know what it's like. Uh, Having kids is a, 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 raising kids rather, I should say, it's a very painful experience because you want all these good things for them. You're trying to do everything you can, but they want to pull away and do something else. And you realize that you don't have control over certain things. And I, at some stage, I just feel like, okay, I'm going to do the best I can in things that I have control over. The other stuff is will fall into place. And fortunately for me, things, they've fallen into place. Mm-hmm. So going back to your question, what do I tell them? It's up to you 
what are you willing to do to change or improve your life if you want to do better you have to get up you got to do your homework you got to study you got to go exercise all these things that you want don't wait for somebody else or hope somebody else um to be the one to 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 uh, waiting for a, hand, a handout yeah. you should be the one to get up and go and do your stuff sure uh, i'm sorry my answers are long i think <laughs> This is the opportune moment to have this conversation, Bob Richman Mashang. And so don't worry about the way you're answering questions. I am fascinated by your level of zeal. Um, you said you failed eight times. I know people who have failed twice. I know instances where I failed three times. And I'm like, ah, maybe this is not for me. Let's talk about, and you, you touched on psychology as well, um, speaking to Western psychology and how it frames life. You've stepped into psychology. I find it really interesting uh, just listening to you that you have such a level of maturity when it comes to your state of thinking. Uh, what swayed you towards psychology? What happened is uh, uh, my undergraduate was in theater arts because I thought I, I wanted to be an actor so I could go back home and be the probably the only uh, uh, South African who had American training. But again, there was a, a, a pipe dream because, um, again, this is a, a, a lack of advice, a lack of understanding how the American system worked. Because first thing, I have a very thick accent in America. Uh, if I knew that, I would have not studied theater. And uh, black people who are Americans, who have got the right accent, great actors, have a hard time getting employment sometimes in Hollywood and, and New York. So if I knew that, if somebody told me that, I would have studied something else. After, But I was too far in into the theater, so I finished it. But I always knew I wanted to go to graduate school. Mm. Uh, I actually started marriage and family counseling in the beginning. Um, I, I, always, uh, uh, I was always uh, attracted to the idea of family structure. Because in my mind, I thought, I don't think kids can actually be successful if there's a broken family structure. If somehow one can fix this idea of a family structure where there's mom and dad, there's two people there who are raising the kids. Uh, sometimes they have a saying saying, you know, it takes a village. Um, uh, but in a, in a family uh, situation, because I was very happy in my family, my mom and dad, I was, I'm grateful for the values that my mom and dad um, uh, basically taught us, even though it was a short one with my, with my dad. But anyway, so I started marriage and family counseling. In the middle of this, I realized that if I get a nine to five job as a, count, as a marriage and family counselor, I'm not going to have enough time for my kids. And by the way, to tap back into the idea of resiliency, and you say people fail two to three times and they quit, it took me 24 years to get the American citizenship. Wow. Where I, where I basically, because there's this process where so you get a, a, the first visa when you get out of college and you, and you get a company to sponsor you if you're lucky enough, for H-1B, you get a green card and then a U.S. citizenship. But there's the times where we basically we told you, you have to leave within five days, I was, you'd be deported. And I would grab my children and, my, and, my, uh, and their mother, um, my ex-wife, and we'd get in a plane and we'd go to Europe not knowing whether we could come back or not. And sometimes we came to South Africa not knowing whether we, we will come back or not, because if the visa will be granted. But in my mind, I was not going to give up on my dream of going to graduate school, finishing so my children had a better life. So the idea of psychology, I feel very fortunate to be been raised in Africa because there's so many uh, great uh, values in an African culture that uh, they they hold me very, very, very strong in terms of not being easily p uh, persuaded or swayed by other influences of other cultures. Mm -hmm. So I try to, I mean, I've read a little bit about the, uh, stoicism, to be a stoic and look at life uh, as is, uh, instead of sometimes about uh, being persuaded by just emotions or uh, another culture that um, believes that their way of doing things uh, is a better way. Mm -hmm. um, so that is where basically I feel uh, that uh, has helped me make these better decisions. Um, at the same time, I make a lot of mistakes. I've made a, made a lot of mistakes in my life and I, I try as hard as I can to learn from them. Mm -hmm. uh, because learning, uh, making these mistakes, I think is also a good thing because you, you, you can now reevaluate whether you did something good or not. And if, you, if, if we're smart enough, when we make mistakes, mistakes we're supposed to learn from them and do better next time 
so I mean, I studied educational psychology is dealing mostly with uh, lives of young, young children, which is very fascinating to me. I'm very fascinated by young people, which is why I poured my heart in raising my children uh, because I didn't have that other than the, the, the men in at Ewema, uh, Tim Gray and, and KK Mtiani, Paolo Zulu, Sipo Ngobo, Sipo Ngumad and all these gentlemen. They saved me because I got to see them in action, how they behaved. And then I knew that one day when I have children, I want to be there for my kids because one of the biggest unfortunate thing we have in our black community, regardless whether it's Africa, America, wherever you are, is the absence of black men in our community raising their children. Somehow we have our uh, black men having kids all over the bloody place, uh, excuse me, and um, leaving the, the, the mothers, the, the, the wives, the girlfriends um, with the responsibility of raising children and then they have children somewhere else. Yeah. So, uh, and that happened in my own family Again, this was, I feel horrible for my sisters because they never really had a realistic opportunity to be successful, get an education, avoid all this stuff. And, but in some way, this was a blessing for me because I got to see firsthand the repercussions of that life. And then I avoided having a close girlfriend as much as I possibly can. Uh, my rescue was the every day after school, my, I had to carry this, this plastic bag full of tennis balls and a tennis racket straight from, uh, from class to go and play against the wall or Benson would play with me. He was kind because he was much better than me, but he was very kind to, um, you know, to practice with me and coach me and then Tim Gray. So the tennis and the whole idea of education became kind of like the destiny uh, to avoid this stuff. So all these things I saw happening in the township um, even within my family, they guided me to avoid certain things, uh, to be able to achieve certain things. So uh, I feel very, very blessed. But people, I, I want people to know they hear, well, he lives in America. It's not that simple. It's not that easy. It's a, it's a struggle um, every day. But the reward is incredible if you are willing to go out there and, and try hard and, and, and do things. But my biggest passion is to come home, celebrate with the people, the 30 years of democracy, but to empower our young people. Uh, I've actually been coming to South Africa the last couple of years before the pandemic and go to schools and, and talk to the kids. And I get embarrassed because my Zulu is now absolutely terrible. And, uh, and uh, I don't speak Zulu to them, which saddens me because I don't want them to get this idea that speaking English makes you a better person because mm -hmm. English is just, English is just a language, it's just the way we communicate. In fact, one day when I come home, I wanna actually be able to, to hold the, my talks in Zulu. So I'm gonna have to ask my, my manager, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Musa Zulu to, to, to give me some Zulu lessons again, coach me. <laughs> <laughs> that is the voice of anyway. educational psychologist <laughs> and author of Zulu Dreams and Success Beyond Expectation. This ahead of his tour back home and this is in South Africa this coming June. We take a bit of a breather. When we get back, we wrap up conversations with Rich Mitha Mashangu. When it is all said and done, Africa, let's talk. We are still hanging out with Bab Richman Mashangu, author and motivational speaker of books like Zulu Dreams, Beyond Expectation, and uh, yeah, we're still hanging out with Sheila as well. She's still in studio. Um, Bab Mashangu, I want us to touch yes, on sir. the psychology, your psychology career and uh, your work th therein. Over the years, especially in the educational psychology space, what stories can you share that have changed the lives of those that you have served? Well, you know, it is um, interesting because I think if you look at the, the South African school system or even Europe, it's very different from the American system. So uh, as a counselor, um, I'm trained, obviously, in a mental, mental health uh, uh, base. Mm. Unfortunately, 80% of my work is creating um, schedules for students that they make sure they're in the right classes. Mm. Um, uh, so basically, I have about maybe four, 350 to 400 students, which is actually quite a lot because we're the fifth largest school district in the country. Um, and uh, so I have nine grades through 12, that's high school. 
Uh, I'm responsible for all those kids that fall in my alphabet to create the schedules every year that the next classes are the correct ones. Um, we don't actually get to spend a lot of time with the students unless we call them in or we're doing pre-registration. Uh, and in my school, we are actually fortunate. Um, I'm at Bonanza High School, by the way, in Las Vegas. I'm very, we are very fortunate that we have um, uh, two social workers where they, they kind of take a little bit away from us to focus on this other stuff with schedules with the students who may need uh, mental health uh, help. Of course, we also see them as much as we possibly can. But the idea behind, um, you know, the pandemic happened, the structure of how young people uh, approach life, see life is very different. It's also very different now with all the, I, with the phones because a lot of them, they're burying their heads into the phones. Mm -hmm. Most of our teachers here who are basically the one in the classroom, um, these people are uh, absolutely just saints because the responsibility that they, they, they have of 38, uh, 40 students sometimes in the classroom who basically wants to be on their phones every single minute, it's, a, it's an unbelievable task. But I do the best I can to share uh, my experiences, things that have happened in my life, uh, but again, remember also, very often, I am a foreigner in this country. My, I have an accent, I open my mouth, they all look at me and they realize I'm not from here. Sometimes things that I may say may sound, uh, you know, a little bit funny or different. Um, mm. You know, uh, this guy is not from here. What does he, you know, what does he know about, about life? Um, you know, how does he know about my life? Uh, and sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, as a black person, you think you're going to relate better because some people look like you. It's not always that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's just mm -hmm. how life is. Pe people are, are more comfortable with what they're familiar with. And I'm not uh, criticizing American people. I'm just stating facts. And it's the same thing if you go to Europe or you go, you know, you go to England. Uh, it's just it's just the way it is. Um, but uh, the idea of psychology is very interesting to me, how the human brain works, how people think. Uh, how these cultures, you know, have influenced us. Uh, at the same time, I've spent a lot of time in my life alone thinking about life. Um, for example, I had a hard time um, with the uh, organized religion. When I say I have a hard time, uh, I don't buy into a lot of stuff. Um, and I, But at the same time, I don't necessarily criticize anybody. I think people should do what makes them happy. Mm. Uh, as long as they don't necessarily start reaching across and telling other people how to live or what to do. And then I'm comfortable in that space. And I'm going to ask for one favor before this interview is over to say hello to my family, if you don't mind. Oh, Bob Malkang, I want to throw you off. Yeah. Oh, are you okay there? Yes. I want to throw yeah, you off. Gonna... I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. There. I wanted to throw you off a little it's bit. Okay. Your accent, yeah. you didn't lose it. What happened? Usually people go to America and they come back with a very thick American accent. And you, so you made reference of the fact that you lost your Zulu. Your Zulu is depleting by the day. But the accent, yeah. you have not lost it. How did you keep it? What's happening? But this is the point I was trying to make um, uh, uh, indirectly that I'm 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 an African. Uh, I was born in Africa. I I I I I'm, I'm I'm crazy about the African culture. I don't necessarily think that I should speak differently. I live here. I mean, there's some words I say because I hear how people say here. But I mm. I'm not looking. Um, I'm not looking to for anything to change me. There's no reason for me to change. I'm an I'm a, I'm a black man who happened to be born in Africa. And I'm very proud of the uh, uh, African heritage. I don't necessarily think other cultures are better than our cultures. Um, and I think we have different cultures, which is fantastic. And we need to learn, we all need to learn from, um, you know, from, uh, uh, from each other. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you uh, very quickly, you know, a couple of years back when I was married with my children, my children were born in Austria as I mentioned earlier, and my ex-wife is from Austria, she's white, I would come to South Africa, she had her name in my pa uh, 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 with the kids in her passport, mm. her Austrian passport. And we will come through immigration, this is before the end of apartheid. Mm. Um, she would be led through the gate and wait for me for 30 minutes to 
45 minutes to an hour while I was being stopped and having my bags searched mm. when I'm going when I'm going to uh, when I would say I have nothing to declare they would open my bags and turn them upside down and my ex-wife would be waiting for me with the kids she had the name Masang on a passport but because she looked differently than me mm. she could basically just walk in into a foreign country I needed a visa with a South African passport to every single country in the world except for Switzerland when I traveled. So there is no way for me to think that I'm somebody different. I know who I am. I'm proud of who I am. And I, the obstacles that have been put before me, either intentionally or unintentionally, I've had to figure out how to uh, basically navigate and overcome them. Uh, and that made me uh, a little bit more stronger and have a, a thicker skin, gave me resiliency. So. I don't pick up accents uh, a little bit. I mean, if I speak German, somebody can tell I spend most of the time in Vienna mm -hmm. uh, because I have an Austrian accent. But um, I, I don't think, um, and I don't think if people do pick up accent, people try to fit in most of the time, which is fine. I don't try to fit in necessarily. I just, my parents taught me good manners. The men that I grew up around, other people taught me good manners. I think my manners would basically take me give me an A in most places, um, but I am not, um, I don't think that uh, the world is supposed to be here to change me. Um, not at all, no. So um, I'm glad that you, <laughs> you don't know, make me feel bad and think you sound American because I don't sound American. <laughs> uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, but Masangu, let's touch on uh, some events taking place here in South Africa. Once you are looking yep. to travel, uh, to come and witness and celebrate, right? 30 years of democracy. Yes, ma'am. And yes, ma I, I want to, your perspective, your view, because you were present during the apartheid era. What are your thoughts and views on yeah. uh, democracy, the progress thereof in South Africa as it stands? Um, I'm going to disappoint you and say, uh, Politically, I'm not very active. I'm not. Very, I'm not smart enough to understand a lot of politics. I'm gonna just say that way. Um, at the same time, I have to tell you that um, you know, having traveled all over the world or most of the places in the world, I'm so sorry. This sounds a little arrogant. Um, I've been not fortunate to have not an opportunity. I, I, I'm fortunate. I've been fortunate to have had an opportunity to travel into a, a lot of different places outside of South Africa. Um, when I come home after the end of apartheid, it's one place where I actually walk in the street and not have to look if there is a policeman who is looking at me funny, who's going to stop me and ask me questions for no reason. And uh, I have never been any other place uh, where I felt that way, because even when I lived in Europe, and this does not necessarily mean that all police officers are bad, because I've met tons and tons of them that are good. but most of the places where I've been, people stop you and ask you, okay, well, like in, when I was in Vienna, there was not a lot of black people. So when they saw me, they automatically stopped me. Love to see if you have a, a, your, your, your visa. Can I see your passport? And in, this is most places. And then when I came home, the first time after the end of apartheid in South Africa is the first time where I felt like I did not have to look over my shoulder for somebody to stop and ask me, you know, why are you here? What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. In terms of what's happening in South Africa politically, I keep a bit in touch with my family, with my brother, as, as Musiso Matang is my brother. Uh, he goes by Smart. Uh, he's actually in the cover of the book that, uh, that I had success beyond expectations. He updates me a little bit, but I, I, uh, I can speak intelligently about candidates, about what they represent, who they represent. But I, I, I have to say that my house where I grew up, other than the paint, it still looks the same. And I, I was uh, hoping at some stage that certain things in the township uh, would improve. At the same time, I do understand that a lot of people who do not have the education, they are trapped in poverty. There's a saying that a child born in poverty, they're more than likely to die in poverty. I'm a bit more optimistic. I don't necessarily buy into that because I was able to escape that and I think a lot of people can. Mm. But a lot of elderly people, like my, my, my sister uh, as age, for example, who are older than me, who are in their 60s, it's very difficult for them to, to, to escape their poverty because they don't have the education. 
my brother's daughter uh, daughters went to the uh, uh, Durban um, girls high school uh, in in Durban and listening to them speak to start with is funny because I think I'm speaking to a, a, a Caucasian a white South African that's their English is is a, a very different from mine they've gone to university one of them has got a, a, a LLB degree they've had these opportunities so that's a huge obviously improvement from what was there when I was young and I'm I'm lucky to be able to see this in my own family that um, if she can go and get this law degree in South Africa there is a change there is improvement and one of them works at the, and the other one Jennifer works at a, a hospital so they've had the opportunities I think opportunities you know are there but people need training people have to have an education to be able to understand uh, what's going on in the country uh, when um, they have uh, our candidates for our, uh, our politicians coming to their area appealing for their vote they need to be able to understand the political system okay is this is this accurate what this pain is saying is this accurate what this other pain is saying at the moment i'm not in south africa i don't pay a lot of attention to politics here in america because you know what is going on here in terms of politics is an absolute mess at the same time there's a lot of opportunities for people to be successful or to find their destiny um so politically I think people just need to do good research, speak to other people, do some kind of reading, investigate uh, if there are candidates who are trying to solicit their votes, um, you know, uh, uh, so they make an informed decision about who they vote for, yeah. uh, whoever they believe for. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays, people vote for this candidate, even if they don't like the candidate but mm -hmm. they hate the other candidates even more. So they'll vote for the one they, they hate less. And this candidate has nothing to do with improving their lives. Um, and one of the reasons that happens very often, like in America, we have two, uh, we have three parties, but one is has no chance to be successful independents. We have the Democrats and the Republicans. And it's two, and these basically they kind of do whatever they want because I mean, what's the alternative? And in a lot of places, you know, it's similar. If you have only two parts in a government, two or three, and one with no power, the other two kind of just do, I mean, I don't want to say they do whatever they want, but the point I'm trying to make is that there's not a lot of pressure of a lot of changes if a, a certain party is in power and there's no chance of them losing the, those, those votes. Mm. Am I answering your question? No, you have. And I suppose it was more so a reflection of the experience, right? Um, your own personal experiences yeah. pre-democracy uh, and uh, post us establishing this this new government. Nevertheless, before we wrap up the conversation, we are pressed for time. I understand that you yeah. had a special request uh, with respect to your family and this just before you tell us where we can access your book. My book is available uh, um on Amazon, Amazon.com, go to KDP, put in Richmond, Masangu, it should come up. Um, the Zulu Dreams, the autobiography, they still want on Amazon, but it's being edited currently, uh, improved because there's a lot of new uh, events. My kids are out of school, they've got their own jobs. And to my family, uh, I'm gonna start with my sister, Irene, uh, to do Masangu, she lives at Lamonville. I want to say hello to you and, um, you know, good luck with everything. We've had a little bit of a tragedy in my family a uh, couple of weeks back. So Irene is uh, living in the house now where I grew up. And then, of course, my brother, Smart Masangu, he runs a pharmacy in the Monville. I wanted to thank them for all their support because I was the youngest. After my father passed away, my brother, at some stage, they were working. Between 1983 and 84, I finished high school in 83 and then I was supposed to go overseas and the plan fell through. They were working, they supported me. They were not jealous. They didn't treat me terribly. They were very kind. And we've had this very uh, a, a family relationship, even though I have been gone. So I want to thank them and I want to say hello and um, that uh, uh, I, I'm excited to come in and, and visit them uh, in June. And I hope that uh, I did not disappoint them in this interview. Thank you.
Oh, I don't think you disappointed them in this interview. And thank you so much for sharing your story with us. This was exactly the purpose of the conversation uh, to pick and decipher and embrace the gems that you would share with us. Again, uh, to you, Bob Richmond Masangu, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, say my good sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. That podcast was courtesy of Channel Africa, the African Perspective. Perspective.